All right, good morning, everyone. You can make your way back to your seats. So good to see you guys. Hope you're glad to be here. It's good morning. Uh, the title of this morning's message is What If I Stumble? It's a very obvious throwback to every 90s youth group kid who uh, either will listen to DC Talk or Newsboys or uh, Jars of Clay or Audio Adrenaline. Those are your four options as a kid in the 90s. And What If I Stumble is one of the big songs from DC Talk. So that is our title this morning. Now you all know how old I am. Um, we are in the middle of a collection of talks looking at the life of David. And David is such an incredible figure in the Bible. When we look at his life, we can ask questions like, what can we learn from what he did and how he lived? What example did he set? Is it one that we want to follow? Is it one that we want to avoid? And today, this morning, we come to a moment in his story that can only be described as the greatest moral and greatest spiritual failure of his life in the affair that he had with Bathsheba, and the subsequent murder of her husband is a attempt to cover it up. It's not an easy account to reconcile. It's a very difficult passage of scripture to get through and to reconcile what's going on there. And it, it's made even more challenging by the fact that after all of this, after this narrative we look at this morning, David was still looked at by God and said, there's a man after my own heart. How do we reconcile the depth of sin and the weight of failure with the fact that he was still considered a man after God's own heart? And in looking at a story like this, it brings us face-to-face -face with the theme of sin and its consequences. It brings us face-to-face -face with our own shortcomings, our own brokenness, our own failures, our own sin. And there's very few among us who'd be like, yeah, that's a, that's a fun time. I really enjoy being confronted with all of my mistakes at once. That's awesome. It's a difficult thing to go through. And out of this morning, there's really two questions that I want us to be able to sit on. And it's this. The first is... What can I do, what can we do to avoid the mistakes that David made? If we're going to look at the narrative, we're going to see him fail. What can we learn to avoid that? What mistakes can we avoid by looking at what he's done? And then the other one is when we sin. It's not an if we're going to sin. It's a when we sin because we're human and we're sinful by nature. When we sin, how we respond. How we respond when confronted with that in a way that we can still be considered a man or a woman after God's own heart. How can we fail and recover in such a way in our response that God can look at, look at us and say, there is a man, there is a woman who is still after my heart. Now, we are obviously heading into some very heavy territory, so let's start with a moment of levity to get us in there. A, a number of years ago, 16 to be exact, um, I was on staff at Kingsway Foursquare Church in Burnaby. Eric and I were newly married, and uh, we were put in charge of their preteen ministry. For about a year, we ran the preteen ministry at Kingsway, and it was a very vibrant uh, ministry on Friday night to uh, like hundreds of kids from the community and the church, and um, we loved doing it. And as it went out, we would usually be given or assigned our topic for the week. We didn't have like a curriculum of lessons to go through, but we were kind of we had like, a teaching series to go through. And at one point in that year, I got the lesson early in the week, and the lesson plan for the Friday night was David and Bathsheba. And I was like, well, that's that's a funny one to teach to kids. Like, how, how am I going to do this? How do I explain to children how David had sex with a woman that wasn't his wife and then murdered her husband to cover it up? Like, I guess I'm not sure how I unpack that. Am I allowed to say that in front of—I'm sorry, Scott. Am I allowed to say the word sex in front of kids? Like, is that okay, Erica? Like, am I going to get fired for teaching this message to children? Do they even know what those things are? So I looked to Erica because she had far more experience at this time with working with kids than I did. I was at a loss. I'm like, I don't know how to get through this. She's like, it's easy. You just, you just put on the veggie tales. I'm like, hold on a second. They have a veggie tales for David and Bathsheba? Like, what is that one rated? Are we allowed to show that in church? Like, I'm, just, I'm not sure that's going to be a good solution. She said, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's about the story, but they've kind of changed the narrative a bit. It's called King George and the Rubber Ducky. I'm like, yeah, I haven't seen that. <laughs> She's like, you might want to watch it before you teach the thing on Friday night. I'm like, okay, I'll watch it. Who here has seen King George and the Rubber Ducky? Okay, so like just under half. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, so you don't think I'm completely crazy, let me quickly walk you through this. Uh, and we do, I found out, we have a copy at the church. So after this morning, if you really want to unpack the story as a child, we can loan it to you. And you can, you can enjoy King George and the Rubber Ducky. Here's how it goes. It was the time of the Great Pie War in the kingdom, like, like cream pies. And... Um, King George should have gone out to battle, and he chose not to, because King George, who was played by Larry the Cucumber in the, in the cartoon, he really only wanted to do one thing, 
And that was to stay at home in his palace and have a bath. Day in and day out. Because he loved being in his bathtub. And he had a very vast collection of rubber duckies, of which he loved to play with in the bath. And as the story goes, one day he was looking out over his kingdom and he saw a poor little boy named Thomas who was enjoying his bath time in the afternoon and he was playing with a rubber ducky that, that King George didn't have. And immediately King George was filled with envy and he would stop at nothing to acquire the rubber ducky that was not in his collection, the one that belonged to the poor child named Thomas. And the narrative unfolds, he, he breaks in and he steals a rubber ducky for himself and it really, it parallels a good chunk of the David and Bathsheba story. One big change, no one dies in the Vigil Tales version. There's no like murder cover-up. Um, Thomas goes out to war uh, and ends up only just getting like severely hurt by pies. So there's no death involved in the kids' version. He comes back with like PTSD and, and blueberry pies all over his face. Um, but I, as I watched it, I'm like, this is brilliant. Like this is, it's uncovering the core concepts that a kid can understand in a way that relates to them and avoids all the stuff that I shouldn't be talking about with children in the room. So it really worked well. Sorry to say, though, this morning we're not going to watch the VeggieTales version. It's kind of a cop out. But like I said, you can borrow it. We have it, we have it here. Probably a second copy at home. You can loan it. I'll loan it to if you want to watch King George and the Ducky. Uh, it was a great tool in teaching concepts to kids, but I don't think it does us much service this morning to gloss over the reality of what's happening in this passage and to come face-to-face -face with some very difficult, challenging sections of God's Word. Full disclaimer, I recognize the difficulty this morning. It's a difficult message to share. It's a difficult message to hear. There's no way around it. Sin is a serious topic. And before we get into it, I want to quickly unpack three words and say a few things. There's, there's three C words that always come up. I found talking about sin, it's condemnation and conviction and consequence. And condemnation is never the voice of God. Condemnation is always the voice of the enemy. It's the voice that would take all that we've done, all of our mistakes, all of our failures, and throw it back in our face, try to beat us down and say, what a terrible person you are. You're filthy, you're ugly, you're terrible. You'll never recover from this. That is the voice of condemnation that never comes from God and only comes from our enemy or from other people. Then you have the voice of conviction. And that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. And though it's not an easy voice to hear, it's the voice that comes to us and helps us to see our sin as God sees it. To help us to understand what we found ourselves in. To be confronted with the reality of where we're at. And to see us as God sees us. And to say, you need to address this. You need to deal with this. It's not easy to hear that. It's hard to hear that. But it comes out of love. And it comes with grace and with mercy. And that's the voice of our Father saying, I love you so much. You need to deal with this so we can get past it. So you can walk in all that I have for you. And then with the whole idea of condemnation and conviction is the idea of consequence. We don't like consequences as humans, but when we fail, when we sin, it's a natural way that things play out. There are consequences. Forgiveness does not absolve us as consequences. Conviction does not take away the consequence. So in the midst of this loving voice that God comes to us in, we have to recognize the reality of consequence, which we'll see in the story this morning. Now, all that being said, I'm not here this morning to read anyone's mail or to speak to any specific circumstance. We are all human. We are all sinful. We are all broken. We are all imperfect. And therefore, when we turn to a part of his word that talks about this, it's bound to hit every one of us on some level. It's not that I'm trying to pick on someone or God's trying to pick on someone. It's that there's a universality to our humanity. And when we look to things like sin and brokenness, it's something that hits all of us. And honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way because we can only move forward in what God has for us when everything is brought into the light. When it stands fully revealed, we can say that. That is the problem. That is the issue. How do we fix this? How does God restore this? How does God heal this? And when we bring everything into the light, healing can begin, restoration can begin, and we can walk out what God has for us. So quite honestly, we're not playing around this morning. It's not, it's not VeggieTales time at church. We're going to come face to face with some very difficult things. We're going to come face-to-face -face with the greatest failure of David's life, and perhaps we're, God's going to bring us face-to-face -face with our own failure and our own sin. But I believe that if we press into the difficult places, there is something of profound significance that God wants to do in our lives here this morning. Let's pray. God, I ask that as we open your word that, God, you would speak to us. And God, I pray that we would have ears to hear, an open spirit to hear. And God, I pray that when you speak this morning, it would be a voice of love. Though it might be a difficult voice, it might be a 
a challenging voice, might be a convicting voice, God. We pray that it be a voice of love that we hear, God. You are a God of love and of acceptance and of forgiveness who longs to pour your grace and mercy over us. So God, in all that we talk about this morning, may that be what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to be in chapter 11 and chapter 12 of 2 Samuel this morning. It's a, it's a long narrative. And what we're going to do is just kind of walk through it and pause as we need to to see what God's bringing to the surface in the text. Uh, what we have in the first five verses is a number of traps that David falls into. Pitfalls that become him. Areas that he could have avoided, but he just kind of walked headfirst into. And the beauty of it being in the Word of God is that we can now look at those and go, ah, oh, we can avoid that. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Pause there. David remained at Jerusalem. The first trap that he falls into is the trap of disobedience. It's very clear. Verse 1, it was the time when kings went out to battle. As king of Israel, there was a place that he was supposed to be. And it wasn't back home in Jerusalem. David knew where he should have been. He knew the call in his life. He knew the anointing in his life as king. He had a place he was supposed to be, and he chose to disobey what God asked of him and stay behind in Jerusalem. It's the trap of disobedience. And we see that all the time. God calls us to go to the right, and we run to the left. I call it the Jonah principle. We know from the story of Jonah, God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh and speak to them. Jonah goes, yep, yeah, I'm going to go take a boat in the opposite direction as far as I can. You told me to go that way, I'm going this way. The text even says that Jonah tried to flee from God's presence, which is so funny because God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. You cannot run away from his presence. But Jonah tried with all of his might to run as far in the opposite direction as possible, away from God's presence, away from God's call, away from God's voice. And we know how that went. We see the same thing here, that David knew where he was supposed to be, and he chose to go somewhere else. A trap of disobedience. And disobedience leads to destruction. Disobedience leads to destruction. When we know where God has asked us to be and we choose to be somewhere else, we are acting in disobedience. And when we do that, it opens doors to temptation and it opens doors to destruction that wouldn't have been there if we had stayed the course and obeyed what God had asked us to do. And when it comes to disobedience and where God's asked us, it could be a physical place. Maybe there's a, like an actual place God's asked you to be and you've walked somewhere else. It could just be the arena that you're at in your life I'll use my own life as an example this morning so that I can't be accused of pointing fingers at anybody else. But in my own life right now in this season, there's some very clear areas that God's asked me to serve in. I'm called to be a father to three wonderful girls. I'm called to be a husband to my amazing wife. I'm called to be a pastor. And I know that, and I stay in those areas because that's obedience to God. Now, I could walk away from any of those if I wanted to because I have free will. But in doing that, I'd be disobeying the call he has in my life in this season. And I know that if I chose to walk away from where he's asked me to be, I'm going to be opening doors to temptation that are not going to be good places to go to. I'm going to be opening doors to destruction that is not going to be good places to go to. It's a trap of disobedience. Pick up in verse 2. It says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now in those few verses, there's two more traps that we see. The first is this, it's the trap of isolation. Not only was David disobedient to remain in Jerusalem, but where we see him in Jerusalem is all alone on the rooftop. There's no one there with him. And Pastor Tom introduced this idea last week that would all this have happened if Jonathan was still there with David? That we know from last week's message that Jonathan and David were inseparable. They were the best of friends. They were, God brought them together to walk in accountability with each other and to be soulmates as much as they could be to one another. And you have to, we can't answer the question, but you have to wonder if Jonathan had not died and Jonathan was still present in David's life at this moment, would the next things that happened have happened? You see, we are made for relationship. We are made for community. 
And as part of that, we are also in need of accountability, that when we remove ourselves from relationship, when we remove ourselves from community, we enter the danger zone. It's the trap of isolation. And because we are human and we are sinful, we are in need of accountability because if we don't have it, we are just so prone to just wander into places we don't need to wander into. And that is the trap that David's fallen into here. He was all alone on a rooftop. In that moment, he was alone, but like figuratively, he had no one. He didn't have Jonathan with him anymore. When we distance ourselves from healthy community, we open the door to poor judgment and bad decisions. There is such power in being present in healthy community, and when we isolate ourselves from that, we open that door to poor judgment and bad decisions. And then the other trap we see in these verses is the trap of curiosity. The trap of curiosity. It says that he saw the woman and he inquired about her. He could have just seen the woman and turned away, like, oh, I shouldn't be seeing that. Like, I, I don't know why in ancient culture you bathed on a rooftop. I don't understand that, that concept, but that's what happened in that culture. So he could have seen her and turned away, but it says he saw her and he inquired about her. He was curious. He wanted to know more. He could have turned away, and we know that that happens. It's the example of Joseph in Potiphar's household, that when Potiphar's wife came after Joseph, he fleed. It says he fleed basically half-naked out of the house because he was like, I don't want any part of this. I will have no temptation before me. I am going to run away from this as fast as I can. David could have done the same thing, but instead he looked into it. He let his gaze linger, and he wanted to learn more. He was curious. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to see everything. You don't need to hear everything. You don't need to experience everything. There's this innate need in humanity to want to kind of try it all, right? It's the fear of missing out, FOMO. I don't want to, I want to, I want to experience it all. I want to see it all. What if I miss something? You don't have to experience everything. You don't have to know everything. It's okay to have good boundaries in your life. In fact, it's necessary. So if we're going to make this personal for us, here's the application. The traps that David fell into in this passage become like warning signs for us. And I think of those old cartoons where the main character would be like careening towards the edge of a cliff. And there's these massive signs that say, stop, turn back, warning, danger, cliff. And they just keep just careening headlong through those signs. They crash, they explode, and the character just goes off the edge of the cliff. These five verses are like those warning signs. God's put them here going, if you keep going, it's a cliff you're going over. So pay attention to the massive cartoon warning signs that David, we can learn from David, and turn away. Don't fall into the same trap. God's saying, be where I have asked you to be. Be obedient to my call and my voice. Don't be somewhere you're not supposed to be right now. He's telling us to not isolate ourselves from community, that there is power in healthy relationships, and there is danger in removing ourselves and isolating ourselves from that. And he's asking us to have healthy and appropriate boundaries. And that is a whole message in and of itself, but just really quick, that looks like having places that you can go and places that you know you can't go to. It means knowing people that you can spend time with and people that you shouldn't spend time with. It means being aware of what you watch and what you read and what you listen to. And there's this um, saying that's always stuck with me. It says, unstructured free time will always flow to your weakness. Unstructured free time will always flow to your weakness. See, we love free time. Life is busy. Life is difficult. Life is stressful. We love free time. But if we don't structure it, we're prone to do stupid things. As a teenager, I was prone to do stupid things. I feel terrible for my parents who are here in first service because, like, when I preach, it's like the great confession moment. They just learn stories that I've never told them before. (laughs) And we have to figure it out afterwards. But um, as I I was a teenager, I had great friends. You know, we didn't do anything really stupid or idiotic, maybe a few things. But we would often structure our free time. We were, you know, teenagers in the 90s. Let's go to Blockbuster. Let's rent some video games. Let's play them for the afternoon. There's a very clear plan in place. Good use of our free time. You know, let's do something crazy. Let's grab a bunch of our old toys and make stupid videos in the backyard and put them, you know, share them with our friends. You know, it was, it was stupid, but it was a good use of our time. Then there's other days where it's like, what do you want to do today? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. You want to go to 7-Eleven and blow all of our money on candy? Yeah, let's do that. It's like, it's not sinful. It's not a good idea. Waste of my money. Felt really sick afterwards. You want to like, want to go buy donuts and throw them at people? Sure, let's do that. I mean, we just, we, when we didn't structure our time well, we made poor decisions, right? And now as an adult, if you've been in my office or come to my house, you know I have a stack of books that I say I'm going to read sometime. I have a bunch of shows on my PVR saved that I'd like to watch sometime. I have projects on the home that I mean to get to. But if I don't structure my free time in such a way that I am going gonna, gonna to do that, you will find me on the couch or, or in the bed just scrolling mindlessly through Facebook, watching stupid videos on YouTube. Nothing inherently sinful or wrong, 
but I have wasted that time because I've allowed it to flow to my weakness. And the challenge is if you don't have healthy boundaries in place, in those moments, it flows to places you shouldn't go, things that you shouldn't watch, people you shouldn't be with, things you shouldn't be doing. When you don't have healthy boundaries in place, instead of just wasting an afternoon looking at stupid things on the internet, you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at on the internet because you don't have healthy boundaries. Don't fall victim to the same traps that David did. Pick up 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to reread verse 5 and then go to verse 6. In verse 5 it says, Bathsheba conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. And then verse 6, so David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. Right there, in between verse 5 and verse 6 is something incredibly important. There's a choice that David makes in that moment in between verses. In verse 5, he learns the woman that wasn't his that he laid with is pregnant. And in verse 6, he sends for her husband. Because in, in between verses there, he made a choice. Because the news of her pregnancy, it brought him to a crossroad. He realizes now there is very tangible, physical evidence of my indiscretion. What am I going to do with this? Am I going to cover it up and try to like brush it under the rug and figure it out? Or am I going to come clean and tell the truth of what's happened? And in between those two verses there, there's a choice that's made. And it's the same crossroad we all come to. You know, if you have kids who have ever broken a plate or a glass, they come to that crossroad. Do I throw it in the garbage can and hope mom and dad don't notice we're like one short? Or do I tell them, I'm really sorry I broke something? You know, maybe as a teenager or an adult, you've cheated on a test or, you know, forged an exam or something and you're caught. And it's like, do I, do I perpetuate the lie to try to get out of this? Or do I just come clean? Yeah, I, I screwed up. As an adult, we have a variety of poor life choices that we could make. When we make them, do we come clean? Or do we just try to cover it up and justify why we did it and brush it under the rug? David does this in verse 7. It says, when Uriah came to him, David asked how Job was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? You see, what David's trying to do here is to cover up the pregnancy. If he can have Uriah, the husband, come home from war and sleep with his wife, then he can spin a story where the proper husband got the wife pregnant, not David. So he tries to force this to happen in such a way that he can absolve himself of his indiscretion. But Uriah is not having any of it. In verse 11, Uriah says to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next day, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so he made him drunk. In the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. See, so Uriah was a righteous and honorable man. He said to David, I, I can't in good conscience take this rest you've given me and go home and have a feast and be with my wife. Uh, well, my friends, my soldiers, my fellow uh, people in battle are camping in open field while the ark of the Lord and all of Israel are out at war. I, I cannot take that. Thank you, but no thanks. And he doesn't go in to be with his wife. And David tries to push him a little bit further. So the next day he brings Uriah over and he tries to get him drunk enough to lower his inhibition so he'll just happen to make it happen. And it still doesn't. See, what's really interesting is David, who is a man after God's own heart, who is so righteous, is now met with someone who is just as righteous. And I'm not, the parallel is not lost to me. A couple weeks ago, I preached about David's heart of worship. And there is this part, a couple chapters earlier, where he brings the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem, back where it's meant to be. And I preached about the part where he is restless at night. He can't sleep. And he goes to Nathan, the prophet, says, how can I sleep in this amazing palace while the Ark of the Lord, while his presence is under a tent? I can't do it. I'm bothered by that. And I see the same parallel here where your eyes saying, how can I go and enjoy time with my wife at home? Well, the ark of God, well, the God's presence and his people are out to war. How can I do that? And what strikes me is how much sin can change and distort and twist you from who God's asked you to be. 
Just a few chapters earlier, David was saying the same thing. How can I sit in this palace while God's presence is under a tent? And now Uriah is saying to David, how can I be with my wife and enjoy rest while God's presence and his people are at war? I can't do it. Sin had so begun to twist and distort David that he no longer resembles the person he was a few chapters earlier. And in verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. And Uriah the Hittite also died. And to verse 26, when the wife of Uriah, when Bathsheba, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So David tried to cover it all up through deception. If I can just get the actual husband to come sleep with his wife, then we'll just, we're, in the, we're in the clear, we're good. That didn't work, so he's like, well, what am I going to do now? I'll have to get rid of the husband. I'll have to find some way that he can die. Because you look at the end there, after Bathsheba mourns for her fallen husband, David does the, honor, the honorable thing and brings the widow into his house and marries her and raises the son. He knows the sin of that moment. But it's a great cover-up. If I can just get rid of the husband, then I can look like I'm doing the honorable thing, even though all this is perpetuated by sin and by failing. David allowed himself to fall deeper and deeper into sin. He could have chosen to stop and turn from evil at any stage along the way, but once sin gets started, it's really hard to stop it. And what I find really, really interesting is that last line. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. It doesn't say that David displeased the Lord. It says a thing he had done. And so often... We have a hard time separating that. As a sinner, God still loves me. I'm still his child. He still cares for me. He wants his best for me. He's not looking at me and going, you screwed up so much, Danny. You are a failure. I can't stand to look at you. No, I say, I love you, but the thing that you did, that I don't like. We have to address that. We have to fix that. And that's the same thing here. What David did was horrendous, but God isn't saying, David, I can't stand you. He's saying that thing you did, I can't stand it displeases me. We need to fix that. We need to address that somehow. You see, church, sin will take you further than you ever want to go, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Every time. And we see that in David's life. Sin will take you further than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. So the question for us is, what choice will you make in the moment when you sin, and that moment will come because we're all sinful, what choice will you make? Will you try to cover it up? Will you attempt to justify your own actions, or you just simply come clean before God? Ask forgiveness of those who have wronged, and ask God to clean your heart and forgive you. David's fall re reveals this slippery slope that we all find ourselves in when we allow sin to creep into our lives. And the thing about a slippery slope is it's a lot easier to stop near the top than when you're already halfway down and momentum has taken hold of you. It's, it's not easy at that point, but it's so hard in our humanness, in our mind, to stop at the beginning in the light of the consequence or what we may have to face in doing that. David chose to just keep going. He just got deeper and deeper into it. But what choice will we make? And then we're going to turn the page to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is this moment in time. It's incredibly important. And we all have moments in time that are incredibly important, moments that, that resonate, moments that we look to and go, that moment forever altered the trajectory of my life. How I responded in that moment for, altered where I'm going. You know, for me, I have many of those. Being in the room when my firstborn was born, that's a moment of resonance that will stay with me. There's nothing like that moment where you know you have now become a father and being a part of that. Like that is a moment that forever changed the trajectory of my life. There are other times, and I, I won't go into great detail because this is not where we're going this morning, but I remember duking it out with God, being on my bed and knowing that I have a choice in this moment to go where he's asked me to or to not. And if, depending how I choose, that will forever alter where I go next and my life 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the road. There are moments of great resonance. And here in chapter 12, roughly a year after Bathsheba and Uriah, a year of David sitting with this sin and cover-up, 
God sends the prophet Nathan to him for this moment, for this moment of great resonance that will forever alter David's life. Chapter 12, verse 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David. And he came to him and he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought. And when he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children, it used he used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. The sheep was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. and He was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. So he took the poor man's lamb, prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse 5, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. See, Nathan as a prophet would often come before David with matters where David needed to make a ruling, you know, judicial matter. King, what do you want to do in this place? So he comes under that pretense, King, I have a, a situation you need to deal with. What do you think of this? And the, the circumstances of that story, the circumstances of that parable are so exquisitely crafted to heighten David's pity for the poor man and to raise his anger and his indignation against the oppressor. But a year into this, David has become so insensitive and so blind to his own sins, he doesn't even realize that he is the villain in the story. And that is, that is one of the great casualties when we allow sin to take root in our life is how it affects our spiritual insight. The lack of sensitivity we suddenly have to things of God, the lack of discernment we suddenly have that I like to call like spiritual blinders, that we are so far into it we can't even see how far we've strayed and how much of a mess we've made. We have these blinders on. We've, lacked our, we've lost our ability to see with spiritual insight. And in those moments, God will often send someone to us who has the difficult job of trying to take those blinders off of our eyes. And that was Nathan's job here. And Nathan was able to help David see his own wrongdoing and his own sin by showing David that if anyone else had done this thing, David wouldn't have tolerated it. So how can you tolerate yourself? Verse 7, Nathan said to David, Well, David, you are that man. The man that you think deserves to die, that's you. You are the man of this story. You are the villain of this story. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added you to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Nathan doesn't pull any punches. He just calls David right out and says, you are that man. You are the villain of the story. You are the rich man who preyed on the poor man. And what's really interesting, not only does he call David out, but in the parable... And in the aftermath of that, he identifies in David's life the true nature of the sin. The true nature of the sin wasn't necessarily the indiscretion with Bathsheba. It wasn't the, the murder of Uriah. That was all a part of it. The true nature of David's sin was his abuse of power in that moment. There was a great inequity of power. He was king. Bathsheba was a woman in the kingdom. You don't say no to the king if he asks you to come over to the, king, to the palace. And as king... And as God's anointed, David would have been held to a higher standard, and therefore he abused the power that God had given us, given him. He fell prey to the mindset that I'm king, I can do whatever I want, I can take whatever I want. I was talking to someone this week, in, in pop culture, if you watch like an a, a old movie of like a king surveying his kingdom, usually it's always to like puff him up. Look how great my kingdom is. Look at all these things that I have. And in very real sense, that's probably what David was doing. He was surveying his kingdom and he saw something that he didn't have. He's like, that, I want, I want that. He abused his power. And what I find really interesting is that he always had someone else do the dirty work. He sent guards to grab Bathsheba and bring her to him. And the great irony, he put into Uriah's hand the letter that condemned Uriah to death. Could you imagine delivering your own death sentence to somebody? Like, David didn't do any of that. He didn't put the sword through Uriah. He made someone else do it. He tried to wash his hands of this throughout the entire process. 
Even according to Nathan in the parable, David's sin isn't merely that he slept with Bathsheba, but that he did so in a way mired by his exploitation of power, deception, and self-gain. The power imbalance is very clearly called out. And he leveraged his position as king to have an innocent man killed after using that same power to summon and to sexually exploit a woman. We're not going to sugarcoat what David did this morning. There's no way around it. But what is so important and so telling in the face of such awful failure and terrible sin is David's response. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has now put away your sin. You shall not die. It is one verse, and there is very little there, but the weight of what is happening is so incredible. In that moment, David's like, yeah, I, I really, really messed up. He seizes that moment, and he comes clean in confession, and he comes clean in repentance, and though what was owed him by his own mouth was death, because when he responded to the parable, he said, this person should die. Nathan says, the Lord has put your sin away from you, and you, you will not die. You will not die. There is grace, and there is mercy, and there is forgiveness in this moment. So before we move on, there's a few pieces of application here for us. The first is this. Do you have spiritual blinders on? Are you blind to how far you've strayed from what God has for you? Do you need someone to come into your life and take those off of your eyes? And maybe you don't know because you have them on, and maybe all you need to do this morning is just realize that it's, it's an option. Maybe you need to be open to hearing God speak through someone to you because you have some blinders on. The other one is this. When your moment comes, how will you respond? When you are confronted with all the ugliness of your sin and your mistake and your failing, how will you respond? Will you be like David and say, I have sinned against the Lord. I confess my wrongdoing and I turn from it and I repent. Knowing that God will respond, respond to you in kind and say, I've put your sin away from you. You will not die. I love you. I have grace for you. Now, the one thing we can't avoid, and it's, it's a rough one to kind of end on, but it leads towards a point of hope is the idea that there's, there is consequence. David does not, does, there's no get out of jail free card here for David. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, Nathan continues, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I'll take your wives before your eyes, and I'll give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David then responds, and then in verse 14, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. There was very real and very tragic consequence for David's indiscretion, for his sin. He couldn't avoid it. Though David responded to God in humility, though he responded in confession and repentance, there were still very real consequences for his actions. And that's something we'll have to grapple with. God forgives. But forgiveness is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Forgiveness is not suddenly put a full stop on consequence. That God forgives and he has grace and he has compassion. He has a heart for us, but it doesn't just put a stop in the consequences that we still need to face. See, David never took God's forgiveness lightly or his blessing for granted. And in turn, God never held back from David either his forgiveness or the full consequences of his actions. David experienced the joy of forgiveness even when he had to suffer through the consequences of sin. And there's this interesting thing here. We tend to get those things re reversed. Too often, we would rather avoid consequence than walk in the fullness of forgiveness. Too often, we'd be like, yeah, I don't want that consequence. Can I just cover it up and oh, maybe I'll get like partial forgiveness? Like we, so often in our humanity, we hate consequence. We would rather avoid that than walk in the fullness of forgiveness that God has for us. David chose to do that. He chose to walk in the fullness, no matter how difficult the consequence was. And his response, once again, is incredible in, in verse 19 and 20. And we're just about wrapping up here. Verse 19 and 20 says, But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. In the face of tragic consequence, David chose to worship. So often I see us, in the face of consequence, cursing God, blaming God, getting angry at God, throwing it all on him. And David said, no, 
I brought this on myself. I'm going to choose to worship my God in this. In the midst of ridiculously tragic consequence, I'm going to choose to worship God. I'm not going to get angry at him. I'm not going to blame him. I'm not going to curse him. I'm going to worship him. And then in verse 24 and 25, we see hope. And it's the message of the gospel that there is always hope in the face of tragedy. Always hope in the face of tragedy. Verse 24, David then comforted his wife Bathsheba for the loss of their son, and he went in and he lay with her, and she bore him another son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So Nathan called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. And names have such profound meaning in Scripture, and with both Solomon and Solomon is what David named the son, and Jedidiah is what the Lord told Nathan to name the son. Both of those names carry the weight of God's favor on that child, God's love for that child. And we see in those names something prophetically spoken over that child that comes to pass providentially when Solomon becomes the heir to David. He becomes the king that builds the temple for the presence of the Lord. There's this incredible picture of in that moment, out of great tragedy and great consequence, there is hope and there is promise and there's a fulfillment of what God has spoken in David's life at a previous time. It's unbelievable. And there is always that level of promise and of hope for us. So I ask us this morning, church, will you accept the consequences in order to walk in forgiveness and freedom? How will you respond when you face those consequences? Will you blame God? Will you get angry at him? Or will you choose to worship him? In the midst of tragedy, in the midst of perhaps the darkest end of your soul, will you hold fast to his promise and will you seek and find hope in that moment? I'm going to ask the worship team, wherever they are, to come join me as we come to a close. I believe God is speaking some very specific things to us this morning in response to the story of David. First is this, he's asking us to heed the warning signs, to see those giant cartoon signs on the edge of the cliff and to turn the opposite direction, to avoid the trap that David fell into, to heed the warning signs of Scripture. He's asking us to not try to hide or cover up our sin. Let's be honest, it's kind of laughable to think that we can hide our sin from God. He knows what you've done but he still loves you so much. He has so much grace for you. And he's saying, don't, don't try to, let's not play that game. Don't try to hide your sin. Don't try to cover it up. He's saying, just come to grips with it. Confess it to me. Come to me in repentance. Turn from it and respond in worship. Respond in, in softness of heart to what I want to do in you. You turn as we close to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, if you read kind of the subtitle before we get to verse 1, it says that this is a psalm of David. It's one that he wrote after Nathan confronted him with his sin and after the the affair with Bathsheba. And, And David pens these words, and he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing loud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, for I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Only someone who has come face to face with the reality of their sin and the ugliness of what they have done, but who has a knowledge of who God is and his grace and his love and his forgiveness can pen such incredibly powerful and emotional and profound words. 
Before we come to the communion table, Paul writes to the church, 1 Corinthians, regarding the Lord's Supper. He says, let a person examine himself then before eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. And we're going to take a minute here as the team leads us in the song that was birthed out of Psalm 51. It's a moment of reflection for all of us. It's a time for us to examine ourselves before God. Perhaps this morning you have something you need to confess. Perhaps this morning you have something you need to repent, you need to turn from. Perhaps this morning you need to just respond and worship. You've been holding on to too much anger and frustration at God for the consequences you're walking in. You just need to let it go and worship Him in this moment. Or perhaps you just need to reflect on the words that David penned, knowing that at some point you're going to need to say those, to sing those, to speak those. We're going to come to the communion table in a minute, but first, let's sing this song. Let's worship. Let's reflect on what God's speaking to each one of us this morning. this morning than at the communion table. The, the bread, the, the cup, it's symbolic of the price that he paid for all of us. We come here to remember the price and to celebrate the hope we have in him. And I'm keenly aware of the fact that it is, it is difficult to come to grips with the consequence of the Old Testament, that we see what David had to walk out now. And it's, it's a rough go. And we go, how can, how can that be? How can a loving God allow that to happen? You know, at the end of the day, David knew the order of things as God has established them. David knew God's law. He, he wrote about it over and over again in the Psalms. How much he loved the word of the Lord. How much he loved the law and the commands of God. He knew when Moses stood before the Israelites and said, the Lord God says to you today, you can choose life or you can choose death. 
You can follow me in my ways, my commands, and there is life and there's blessing. You can choose to stray from those and there's death and there's consequence. David knew that. In the end, you know, did, did God force us on David? No, David brought us on himself. He knew full well what would happen, the consequences that would come if he chose to disobey God and, and, and stray from his command. And we come here today, though, and go, but Jesus, just as, as God spared David his life, we have all been had our lives spared. Jesus paid the price on the cross, and he broke his body, and his blood was poured out, not just for a, for a ritual or for a symbol, but for every single one of us. Not just for humanity in a, in a grand sense, but for you and for me. That when he hung on that cross, he willingly went there and poured his life for every mistake I've made, for every sin I've ever committed or will commit. And so we come to the table this morning and say, God, thank you. Thank you that in light of my brokenness, in light of my sinfulness, you paid it all for me. And now there is hope out of tragedy. There is forgiveness where there is condemnation. There is grace and mercy where there is nothing before. God, we thank you for that. So I'm going to ask those who are serving communion to come forward. As we partake of the bread and the cup, we're going to sing, we're going to worship this morning. What God is doing this morning is very personal. So I'm not going to say wait for a moment when, when the bread comes, when the cracker comes, take it. When you're ready to break that and eat it, you do so. When the cup comes, when you're ready, do so. This is a, a personal time between you and God to thank him for the price he paid and to celebrate the hope that we have in him. So God, we thank you for your body broken for us. God, we thank you for you, your blood poured out for us. God, as Paul wrote to the church, he said, I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the, the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So God, we thank you that we have the opportunity this morning to proclaim what you did for us, to remember the price that was paid, and to celebrate the victory and the freedom that we have because of that, that we have hope, every single one of us, no matter what we are facing, whether we are in a season of gladness and blessing or whether we are in a season that is the darkest night of our soul, we have hope because of you. God, we pray that in this moment as we worship, as we sing, as we break bread, and drink the cup, God, that you would do something profound in our lives. In Jesus' name.
forgive a child and, and set right which is broken or need amending. God, you look to us and you're like, my child, I just need you to come clean. I need you to stand in the light with everything revealed so we can heal and restore and walk out the great story I have for you. He has such love and forgiveness for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, 
We ask this question every week. It's the most important question we can ask. It's the, the Jesus question. If you're here this morning and you have never made that personal choice to have Jesus be your Lord and Savior, to acknowledge the price that he paid for your sin and the forgiveness that he freely extends to you, if that's you this morning, I would love to pray for you as you make that decision. Would you raise your hand? I would love to pray for you. for us. And God, this morning as we come to a close, I pray these things. God, I pray that we would see the warning signs. God, I pray that we would not fall victim to the same traps that David did. Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see when we are too close to the cliff. God, I pray you'd open our eyes to see when we have wandered too far from what you have for us. I pray that you would open our eyes to see where we have boundaries that are in need of strengthening. God, would you open our eyes to see the warning signs and avoid the traps that the enemy lays for us and that we lay for ourselves sometimes. God, I pray that when we sin, it's not an if, it's a when. God, I pray that when we sin, that we would respond like a man or a woman after God's own heart. That we would come clean. We wouldn't try to cover it up or sweep it under the rug, Lord God, that we would come clean in confession and repentance and just bow before you and say, God, I've sinned against you. I need your forgiveness. I need to turn from what I've done and make these things right. Would you help me to do that? Would you help me to face whatever the consequences are? Would you help me to walk in the fullness of your forgiveness? God, I pray that we would have a heart that would respond in that way. God, we thank you for your word that that doesn't shy away from failure, doesn't shy away from the grave mistakes that David made, but it lays it bare in black and white on the page so that we can learn. And so God, we can know who you are, your character and your goodness and your grace. God, we thank you that you are a God of love and acceptance and forgiveness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And as we come to a close, I'm going to ask the team to lead us in an old hymn to just kind of seal and declare what he's been speaking to us this morning. So let's let's sing the uh, the verse and chorus of this one. today. God is so good. What a great morning. Um, there'll be people at the front if you need prayer for anything, if you need to talk about anything, we're welcome to come forward and speak to those who are at the front. Uh, I bless you in the knowledge of God's love and His grace and His mercy. Have a wonderful day.